Welcome, everyone, or even if you're more than one, or even if you are the one. I'm Layman Pascal, and this is Fire from Heaven, the integral stage interview series devoted to the exploration of spiritual transmission, subtle energy exchange, developmental resonance, and the interpersonal communication of what we don't yet have a better word for than consciousness. Today, I'm sitting down with Krishna Gauchi, an American spiritual practitioner and theorist who has uh, loved and trained with some of the great radical gurus of the 20th century who helped found the Trillium community and the Institute of Awakened Mutuality, and who has decades of rich experience with satsang, the catalytic power of deeper or transcendent withness. He also employs a mandalic framework called the Tapestry of Being that deals with embodied identity and relationships, energetic identity and relationships, and transcendental divine identity and transcendental divine relationships. So he seems like the perfect guy to have on a series like this, and we're happy that he's here. Hi, Chris. Hi, how are you? Nice to meet you, Layman. It's great to be here. Uh, thank you for inviting me on. How was that introduction? Did I get anything wrong? That was good. My, well, Krishna, rather than Chris, usually, I can go either way. It's fine. I definitely have uh, people who call me both. So. Well, I was thinking that uh, as a way of working into the theme and also helping people to get to know you, we might talk a little bit about the different uh, spiritual characters that you were drawn to over the course of your life and how they embodied and contextualized satsang differently, right? Um, where did you find basic flavor differences, intensity differences, differences in how they conceptualized interpersonal spiritual exchange, or, or did you find them to be roughly similar in their approaches? Early on, I worked with somebody named Ken Lloyd Russell, and he was really the first person that I experienced what's usually called transmission that we're calling transmission here, the transmission in the sense of um, radiance or energetic uh, transmission. And um, I don't think what he said, he, he didn't call what he did satsang, but there was a definite way in which just being in his presence kind of, for me, it was kind of mind blowing because he was a gestalt therapist and I went to him for therapy and suddenly I was experiencing radiant, even, um, uh, even seeing, um, energy in the room, something like the, um, the waves that come off of a hot pavement or something, you know, that kind of distortion. And I noticed my own voice and my own sense of myself kinesthetically you know like um, somatically you could say was um, changing and I was relaxing and and that was mind-blowing to me and that was the first time that I experienced simply being in the same room with someone or being in their presence and later on I did phone sessions with them and found it was even even worked on the phone this was a while back before Zoom. Yeah, this is in the 1980s. So I'd say in some ways it was satsang that in the sense of uh, communion with being or um, being together and resting in being. There was a quality of it, but he wasn't calling it satsang. And he had a, uh, a perspective of you know, doing spiritual practice and someday getting enlightened, didn't consider himself enlightened. Years later, in uh, 1992, I heard about um, H.W.L. Punja or Papaji um, because I saw uh, Gangaji and went in 93. And in that case, there was no practice. There was a point, they were pointing out instructions. And um, what was pointed to is our nature as consciousness itself, conscious space, no mind, emptiness, 
And there was radiance, there was transmission in terms of like an energetic feeling sense, but there was no import there. With Ken before, there was some import, although he also kind of played it off and said, well, it's an object like the couch or the chair, so don't think about it much and let's do our work. With Babaji, it was a succession. The transmission itself was not um, just me feeling expanded, but uh, the mind slowing down and stopping um, so that when he did the kind of pointing out instructions that I had read about in Nursigadatta, in, in Nursigadatta Maharaja's book, I Am That, he was doing the same kind of pointing, but now I'm under the influence of this psychoactive presence. And he says, you know, who is it that's aware of this energy? Who is it that's aware of this grace? And it has great impact you can't even i still can't really describe or understand everything that happened uh, in my time with papaji so that was another kind of satsang a satsang in which uh, there was a sort of ruthlessness to him or uh, no compromise often not always but often you know, you'd say, oh, well, I have this going on in my life. And he'd be like, that's the past. What life? Whose life is it? What are you now here? Is there a you now here? And in his transmission, in his presence, it was very easy to let go of thought and find yourself being the space in which everything is arising. So it was gifted. After his passing, I came across some people who were working with a both and approach of the human um, sense of who you are, the ego, all of that simultaneous with a, an understanding that you are consciousness itself. And that transmission, which was initially waking down in mutuality and then um, trillium awakening now, was different. The transmission was different. And we could talk about how, that, how I hold that, how I understand that, what, what I think that means. But the transmission there was something like a combination of what I experienced with Ken Russell before and Papaji later. But the, and the feeling, the somatic sense was far more intense and far more emotional and personal. So it sort of seeped into whatever deep feelings people had. And, um, and so I went through a transition with, with Punjaji, clearly. Um, and I went through another transition later with waking down and mutuality, which actually the source of the waking down and mutuality transmission was um, Samuel Bonder and from him, um, Adi Da Samraj, and really from him, Swami Muktananda and Rudrananda, and from them, Swami Nichinanda. And I realized later that the transmissions roughly, like with Punjaji, it was a transmission. Again, people usually just think of Punjaji as the disciple of Ramana Maharshi, but he also was a very strong um, devotional type and had visions of Krishna and all of this kind of um, transmission of love and devotion that was also really in the transmission with along with a more kind of pure Advaita Vedanta transmission. But the one with uh, Trillium or Waking Down was really tantric in the sense that N Swami Nityananda was, um, uh, he himself didn't, it was very, very difficult to categorize, 
but he talked a lot about the goddess and um, and and uh, Swami Nichiren uh, Muktananda certainly clearly identified the transmission with Kashmir Shaivism, which is a Shiva Shakti transmission. It's one which kind of equally honors both um, the transmission of feeling uh, and energy, as well as um, the space of consciousness. <clears throat> Whereas Advaita Vedanta tends to really emphasize consciousness itself and um, the grace or energy that's accompanying it is um, kind of like a side effect which has both advantages and disadvantages, both of them. They both have their different ways of seeing things that um, are kind of complementary, I think. And Ra Ramana himself, Ramana Maharshi, is, when people approached him about Tantra, he said, oh, well, they're really, they're really not different at the top. They're just a way of describing things differently. So in some way, you could say, that it really comes down to, satsang really comes down to consciousness itself and has um, this component of grace or energy, which is extremely important in itself as well. Um, but there's different emphasis depending on the teachers or the, trans or the lineages. And I feel that the actual transmission, like the energies around these folks, was somewhat different depending on um, the lineage and depending on what the, you know, I think that the, the perspectives and the teachings were describing something that wasn't like, that was, I should say that was um, reflecting the energy and transmission of those people too, so. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. And that's a really interesting question, which is how much of the flavor of a particular type of transmission lineage is sort of objective in the sense of that type is coming down and how much is the character of the person coloring it, both in terms of the person who's providing, <laughs> uh, but also in terms of you and your life and your capacity. You know, if you were to, if the person you are now was with Papa G, would you be receiving that with a different flavor than you received it then? And, you know, like, how, how do you feel about the, you know, how objective versus how lensed from the individuals is it? Right. Well, absolutely. I mean, I, I my own sense is that Quite literally, and we could go into this later if we talk about like meta, the meta picture of everything from my perspective and, and the mandala tapestry, mandala tapestry of being. From my perspective, everything is entirely subjective in that sense. There's never really an objective Buddhism, Hinduism, not even objective Papaji, I, because you always bring, each individual brings themselves to any situation. Um, so in that sense, now that, you know, so we can, for me, that's true anyway. But if we talk more in, just in terms of transmission and lineage, if we're thinking about lineage from this transmission, energetic transmission perspective, which is just one way of using that language of lineage, because you can have teaching lineages and all kinds of other things. But if we're talking in terms of energy or radiance, that kind of transmission. I think it's useful to think of lineage the way you think of a family lineage. So a family lineage is always two people produce a child. And that child is a mix of the, the two before. Mm. And so he might carry the name or she might carry the name of just one of the parents in the past anyway. Now they're doing all kinds of creative things with names. Right. But the very idea of lineage is to be able to trace the name in some sense. Um, so um, I certainly was a different person coming into waking down as a result of being with Papaji. Um, so it's sort of, 
I think the sexual metaphor is helpful in the sense that there's, there's an egg and there's a sperm. So there's somebody who's transmitting, but there's also somebody who's receiving. And the metaphor breaks down because in the sense that you could say it this way, it's a metaphor. So we could say that each time a new transmission takes hold. So you can have, again, using the sexual metaphor, which Tantra likes to use these kind of things, right? Sure. It's, it's, when you're in the presence of, of a particular kind of transmission and you, you are receptive to it um, and you're receiving it, it's a bit like making love. If it takes hold in your being so that it actually is, um, starts to produce changes that are um, significant enough to be permanent or continuous, then it's like becoming pregnant. Um, then you give birth to a new being, which is an amalgam of you, of the past, and the transmission that was received from apparently outside, and then your new person. Now, where the metaphor breaks down is now as that new person, you become pregnant and become a new being again with, with another transmission. So um, this kind of um, mixing of, of these different transmissions is just what happens, just what we are, That's it seems really to me. Nicely said. I appreciate that. Um, the sexual metaphor makes me think of uh, evolutionary dynamics, right? So when we speak about sexuality in Darwinian terms, we think, oh, it's sort of prompted by these uh, – informational units that want to replicate themselves. And so in this kind of uh, merging and reproducting and getting pregnant that you're describing, um, do you think the process just wants to perpetuate itself, keep itself going, or does it have some goal in mind? Is there somewhere it would like the world to go? Hmm. That is very, that's like a, another level. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I'm guessing that God's motives is always kind of like, hmm, it's a little, it's a little, I, I think the, the nature of existence is that it's continuously evolving in, in the sense of, I, I don't know, see, it gets a little tricky when we talk in terms, even even in terms of the, the word evolution, it gets yeah. tricky when we begin to project intention. Yeah. It, it, I, and, and I, it, I wanted to ask about that because yeah. there, there, there's a strong tendency in many lineages to do a kind of sacred personification. Right. right? The, I mean, one way, and when we talk about energy and physics, it's sort of a third person. It's just there. But right. when we talk about these dynamics, very often it's God or the goddess or it, it wants or it, it was trying to do something to me. And how, how useful and or dangerous is that way of interpreting it? Well, you know, it, 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 it could both, right? From my perspective, that, that tendency to want to personify it or create an intention outside even is there um, in the supposed objective scientific idea of evolution not so much by you know people who evolutionary biologists or people who are really in the know of what evolution is but just at the popular level we tend to think of evolution as if it has like some kind of a telos like it was like it's going to be it's going somewhere but if you ask evolutionary scientists like no actually these are just adaptive and in hindsight something appears to have been going somewhere but as it's happening, it's just that this one it could this th even to say adaptive as if it's motion there is a kind of an optical illusion. It's sort of like or it's not optical, but it's a kind of an illusion, right? It, it's survival of the fittest. Is it a given in a, situ a certain situation? This is what lived, and this isn't. And it wasn't some intention in nature to want to create this kind of thing. From the objective point of view, in other words, when we're speaking objectively, from my perspective, 
there's t- really two perspectives. There's an objective perspective, which is what science is about. And, and in the general population, we don't have to be experts in that. I don't have to know why my light works. I just turn it on. But the people who are experts in that, they, in, o- in all of the scientific fields, all the practical fields having to do with science, they are always seeking to be objective and not projecting their own subjective ideas on what it what is. Even that isn't one hundred percent true, but we can just <laughs> just for the sake of conversation, right? But the subjective, the from my partic- from my perspective, is a spiritual, and um, you can, it seems to me describe everything, everything, objectively, even subjective experience from an an objective point of view, from an objective perspective, where you remove yourself from it and you just describe, map out what is. Conversely, if you are a a spiritual person and you know about non-dual teachings, you can do the same subjectively. You can describe everything that appears to be objective outside as arising in consciousness. And in that sense, there really isn't any outside world subjectively. Oh, and the rat, and I'm talking about the radical subject of consciousness itself. So, from the radical perspective, uh, from the subjective perspective, there's there's like the ultimate in which it's unspeakable everything is simply happening of itself nothing is separate from anything else in fact things don't exist in separation at all they just it's just like describing waves on the surface of a lake you can talk about them but they're gone in a moment and they are the activity of the lake itself and they don't exist except as the activity of the lake. There, it's, it's nonsense to speak about them as though they're separate from the lake. But then, for the sake of describing, you do. You say, you describe it as if it's a thing in itself. That's the ultimate. But along the way, along the way uh, to seeing that or taking into account the sense of separateness, there's what in, in Buddhism is called skillful means. There's, there's a way of dealing with uh, or uh, working with relative notions of reality that are more or less useful. Um, ways of, of, of speaking about relative reality that reinforce the sense of contraction and separateness and uh, fear and threat, not very skillful not very helpful. Keep people bound is the usual way of speaking about it. But um, ways of speaking about relative reality that go in the opposite direction, that tend toward removing obstacles between beings and um, making it clearer that we are are, uh, part of one fabric and and making it possible for people to think in ways that they can begin to actually experience that is more skillful, you could say. It's, uh, then ultimately, no language can really contain it, but there's language that's more helpful and less helpful along that way. There are ways of looking at life itself having to do with relating to the whole of life as if, well, let's say it this way. There's a way in which it doesn't. It isn't even true for me to talk to my wife as if she's separate from me. You know, there's a way in which, from a higher perspective, this is just my own self that I'm speaking to. Even when I'm speaking to you, it doesn't have to be somebody intimate. It can be anybody, right? But there's also a way in which it's appropriate and useful, and it's the usual way that we relate to each other, as if the other is, you know, an entirely separate being than me. And that's appropriate and is like a kind of 
necessary skill for um, for adulthood. You know, children, infants don't have to quite differentiate. But at a certain point, you have to be able to do that thing, even if it's not the ultimate thing. It's very useful. So relating to the whole. as if it's a person or has some sense of uh, intelligence of its own, is actually skillful, can be skillful. So relating to the universe as if it is the, the other that contains all others is not only useful, but is probably the pinnacle of use of the dualistic mind. So mystics who speak in terms of God or, or um, primordial Buddha or anything like that, or the goddess, and have a devotional relationship to that one. Now, you know, language is a little weird. Like if, if you think that your God is a separate being different than everything else, and it's outside and creating it, then that's a certain level, right? But it, and it isn't, from my perspective, a very developed way of understanding. But if you recognize that the intelligence of the universe, that you can be in relationship with that. And yes, I am a part of it. And if I fall in love with that one, I dissolve and am, am one with it or I'm an instrument of it, um, then that whole um, frame of, of, of working can be very, very useful. It's very skillful. You know, it's, it's crept its way into, I shouldn't, shouldn't say it crept this way. It was, it was brought into Buddhism, which was like the most like, no, don't think about gods. There's no creator. There's no this, there's no that, right? But still, in the end, they had to populate it with gods and goddesses or Buddhas and bodhisattvas. And because the way of relating, when you are in certain meditative states, you, you begin to feel the non-separateness and you feel compassion and love. So to relate to that compassion and love um, not only makes sense, but actually accelerates your process. Pragmatic sacred personification applicable at all levels exactly and and you know it's pragmatic for the thinking mind because stepping forward pragmatically you end up finding uh oh this experiment is bigger than i thought it, i actually am feeling in the presence of god i actually do feel some obligation to that presence I actually do feel um, a servant to that presence. Who's doing who? I mean, because in the, the end, you yourself are being manifested by consciousness. So if you are feeling the presence of a person, um, is that not God's doing or is that not consciousness's doing? I do like to say that the way in which you experience God, no one else has ever experienced God. So it's that individual. I mean, you could say it in, in another way is that you were manifested in order to see God in a particular way by God, because there are infinite ways um, that consciousness can be seen and experienced. And so, um, and, it, and in, in a way, none of them are actually seeing and experiencing consciousness in and of itself. If that makes any sense. For her. There's a, um, you know, in terms of uh, human social organization to help people understand and appreciate these dimensions of reality, there's a number of different ways to go about that. And the interpersonal resonance quality uh, is only one of those. So I'm, I'm kind of imagining you know, a team of open-minded cognitive scientists and social innovators, and they've gotten together and decided our civilization desperately needs wisdom training or some analogy to the Dharma. And they get that people should be doing practices and working with mindfulness and contemplating ultimate things and uh, involving a participatory dimension of multidimensional health and state change and having mentors 
But what do you say to them when they ask why satsang is important? Or, you know, what would a spiritual approach to life lose if it didn't include that dimension of the process, that person-to-person transmission? I don't know that formal satsang is necessary, but I think the actual experience of satsang is not um, something that that can be stopped even. It's just so natural. You can make an argument that creating situations or, 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 or in where, where that are conducive to, you know, in other words, um, if you're not in a free society, right? And it's, you know, it's against the law to give satsang. That doesn't mean that satsang wouldn't happen. There would be a, a way in which it would happen. Um, but it would be way better <laughs> to have it acknowledged and, 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 and allowed. Okay. And, and, why, and why, why? Would that, why would that be way better? The, the acknowledgement and the possibility of the formal enactment of it. What makes that way better? I mean, it's a bit like asking the question, this is great, and I'm, I'm sorry if I keep, keep putting off the answer. <laughs> it's, a bit, it's a bit like, like asking, um, why is it good to acknowledge, uh, openly acknowledge and even sacralize sexual relationships? You know, marriage or even letting your friends know we're a couple or I'm really, I'm really in love with this person. Why is it important? And would it happen otherwise? It would still happen. Sex would still happen. Love would still happen. The, besides the fa- fact of, of beautifying, it's, it just it makes it uh, the value. It's a hard one because I don't, I don't believe in um, trying to proselytize or convince people of these kind of things, particularly, especially satsang. Is it is it, is it, what you're asking is what is the good for society of it? Something like that. Yeah. Well, what do we? Um, I mean, I, there there was an original question, and then there's like a second question. And the, the original question is sort of, you know, how how important a piece of the overall spiritual experience of human beings is it? You know, if we took that piece out and we had everything else. Would that be satisfactory or, or is something seriously lost if we don't have that piece? Because I know there are traditions in which that piece is regarded as, as almost the quintessence right. of spirituality. Right. Right. That's why I, f- I feel that naturally it would assert itself again and again, but maybe not formally. I mean, the reason that it's understood to be the quintessence and held up that way is kind of to make the point. Like, it's sort of like, okay, you can do a lot of things to prepare yourself for this, but understand that to be in the presence of what it is that you're wishing to find is in itself a communication. Um, There is something, whether it's with a physical person or, because it doesn't necessarily have to happen with a physical person but it's harder to spot. I mean, there's ups and downs because with a physical person, then, then it becomes, you know, uh, there's so many cases where, um, is, it, is it really even satsang? Is this person even really awake? Is this not just a business opportunity? What's going on here? And that's a whole can of worms. It's a whole, I mean, it, that's not a, something to be dismissed. It's like, yeah, are they? And how much of it is the situation and they're on the throne and all the people are, ah, yeah, they're all around and, and you know, but I'm not feeling anything. <laughs> or, or what I'm feeling doesn't feel good. It's the kind of feeling a little weird here, you know. So from, you see, from my perspective, satsang is really intensely personal. So that's why it's, it's like um, a little difficult for me to answer this exactly. but. But there is some way in which satsang itself is the point because all we're doing being together is resting in being, really. And teaching or talking or sharing and communicating 
is something we do in that context of satsang. It's totally, I mean, it happens where you don't say a word. You're just together, but you're resting in the resonance of being, and it's very apparent to people that are there that they are there in the presence of God. It doesn't necessarily, now I get a little strange about it here, uh, God, okay. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the person even that's in, in, in front of you in the chair. I remember when I, when I, um, I went through different things with Papaji, one of the things I did earlier on, early on is tr- really kind of trying to figure out, like I came to see him and the first time I was there, trying to figure out really who, who was he and what was really going on here. I, I mean, I, you know, I, I knew what people were saying, but I wanted to, what's happening here? This is, so at one point I was in his living room and there was just a, two or three of us in, in his living room and he wasn't there. He was in the kitchen. And as I'm talking with my friend and I'm standing there, all of a sudden I feel myself just expanded and just like so much presence. And I was like, what happened? And I looked and he had walked into the room. So I was like, wow. And um, I was watching him interact with people and he was very ordinary, especially at home. In satsang, it's a different thing, the whole situation with all the people. But when he's just with people, he's really just with people, or he was often. And um, so I thought, oh, this is just an old man who God hangs around, who God likes to hang out with, and just is there all the time. I mean, often he would be interacting with somebody, and they would be, their mind would get blown, and he'd go, what happened? What happened? What did you do? What, what to tell me? Come on. And then he'd laugh with them like, wow. So he was as much of a passenger at times as anything else. Sometimes he was clearly like there and in control. But other times it seemed like he, it was happening. Um, what was happening around him was happening. I don't want to say despite him, but in some way, he wasn't, you know, he wasn't necessarily trying to do anything and things were happening all the time. That can happen um, like synchronicities or epiphanies or theophanies. I mean, you can be, many folks have talked about this, you know, you're just minding your own business, doing something, and then all of a sudden, this massive synchronicity, like what somebody said to me yesterday, and then what I just saw a commercial on television, and this, and all of them seem to be a massive communication to me. So at that, when that kind of thing happens, there's two things going on. One is you seem to be, or two, two things appear to be going on. One is you appear to be getting a message about something or other, like, wow, this is like a no-brainer. I have to do this or whatever. But what's the bigger message is the fact that that happened. It's like... Here is the presence of whatever, the intelligence of the universe, God, Buddha, nature, whatever you want to call it. But there's some way in which something larger that you're living in is, is you're in something larger that you're living in. And it's this communication happening. But the fact of it, that there is something to communicate with, or you don't know if it's an it or what, but there's something bigger. That's satsang. That can happen outside of any uh, formal satsang. That's being in the presence of the divine. And that's kind of, most, most times people go in a devotional way with that. Because there's obviously nobody there, so who is it? There's the meta is in communication with you. <laughs> so, uh, yep. if you have a little time where you get together and say we are dedicating the time to honoring that there's a usefulness to that and there can be cultures based on that and there can be people with eyes open to see in their own lives when they're not in the presence of somebody on a couch how that is because i can tell you with papaji especially 
that happened a lot just being around him then you go out you walk and then there were synchronicities all day long and you're like what the heck am i in now what is this um and it's very difficult to describe because they're intensely personal because you heard something earlier and that and that and you're like nobody can see this but me if i describe it even it doesn't sound like much i mean sometimes if you're enthusiastic enough people get it but does that make sense yeah and it, it it brings up for me questions around uh, on the one hand the phenomenon which may occur to us regardless of whether we know about it or regardless of what we think about it and on the other hand certain amplifying factors that might either make it stronger or change it a little bit, or at the very least help people uh, attune themselves toward it more reliably. Yes. And um, I think context, I think having an open conversation about it are, are some of those factors that allow that attunement and stabilization. Uh, there's some other factors. You mentioned a throne a few minutes ago, and that for me brings up this idea that there's uh, – maybe two theories about how to helpfully amplify the experience. All right. One theory is to, if we're thinking in terms of a transmitter or a person who God likes to hang around with a little more, um, that the transmitter requires an elevated context, which honors them and maybe even gives them some star quality that's easy to focus on and uh, helps them uh, reciprocally activate something in other people by resembling the archetype of the divine human. And that this might be a way of facilitating and encouraging the process. But uh, <laughs> it can be argued that that's a relic of theatrical and hierarchical cultures that lend themselves to authoritarian abuse. And that really the transformative power is strengthened by the degree to which the transmitter is more human, messy, vulnerable, unpretentious, really landed in the complexity of human beingness rather than trying to present as the all-accomplishing good person and spiritual hero. So those are two different, in a way, both plausible scenarios for helping the process along. How do you, how do you hold the relationship between those two styles? I just see them as two different styles, you know, uh, uh, both, both of them can be abused and both of them can be cynical. I mean, both of them, you know, it's not, sometimes it's not seen particularly in the West, the way in which the, um, I mean, I've met spiritual teachers who think simply being dismissive of everything shows how enlightened you are and they have their students who feel that way and i'm telling this guy's got nothing but i'm not getting anything here i'm not getting anything but he's certainly an iconoclast and he is by his ruthless fearlessness is showing how real he is and i'm like you know that's another con that's another one and then the guy on the throne who is like go there got nothing but boy what a show and they're often surrounded by people who are like convincing themselves that something is happening and i say this knowing it's all subjective i've been in the presence of people who i go oh these guys are just convincing themselves and then real things are happening for people and i can see they are real things that are happening for people that aren't just emotional acting out whatever or it seems that way. And I, uh, I recognize that I, as a, an, an individual, well, each of us, is not in an ultimate position to really say how everything is for all of these, in all of these situations. So it's always simply my own sense of things. I think that what you described is very, is, is, is all true. In other words, it, it, you can. Uh, sim you can definitely enhance. No, I tend to I I tend to do it less with people, so it's safer. So I, you know, I have a shrine room in which I treat it as a shrine room, and I have certain pictures and certain and lots of statues and um, Buddhist, Hindu, and Christian uh, memorabilia in there that. You know, all it is is a bunch of paper and 
and and and bronze and things like that but it you walk in that room i walk in that room and you know i've heard report you walk in that room and it is powerful so there is a way in which you by honoring certain things you're helped tremendously um you create you know I, you've heard the story of the buddha's tooth have you heard that one i have but why don't you uh okay give a summary for anyone i'll who do has it, it quickly there's a <laughs> <laughs> i mean and i'll, I'll give the krishna version because you know this probably is probably a little different depending on who tells it but uh it's you know um there's 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 a, a monk who uh who's leaving to go to india um he lives in tibet and he wants to see the holy land so he's going to go to india and he tells his mother he's going and his mother says oh if you go to india please get a relic from the buddha like some some kind of thing that would be beautiful for me to put on my altar so he goes to india and he's there for a while and he visits all these sages and gets a tr great experiences and, and he begins his trek back to tibet and just as he's not far from his home he realizes oh i forgot i don't have a relic i forgot my mom wanted a relic what am i going to do and he looks down and there's a carcass of a dead dog in the street and its jaw is open and he sees ah there's a let me get one of these teeth here he pulls a tooth out of a dead dog and he and brushes it off a little bit and puts it in a nice silk and and he sees his mother and she says oh did you bring me a uh, a relic from the, and he says yes i have the buddha's canine she's like ah you know so the story is is she puts it on her altar and she meditates with it all day and then there's radiance that starts to come from this tooth and she becomes a transformed being and everybody in the block knows about it they start to come and then all the people in the town come and it becomes a shrine site and people have all kinds of experiences and awakenings and all of this as a result so you know i always i i, I like this because this is the tibetans telling you their trade secrets it's it's like you know this is the buddha's tooth becomes the buddha's tooth because of the devotion of the people involved and um that's also true for some gurus they become what they are because there's enough devotion there so is it a relic from the past all of this is relics from the past i mean everything that we're talking about is from thousands of years i mean you know, this is what spiritual lineage is long um is it still useful it depends on the person it depends on the person I, you know there are people who are legitimate realizers who use all of the, the bells and whistles and all of the thing because it really makes it easier for people to project their own authority on uh, the teacher and so they can let go and relax more easily and you could say well that's that's not good it's, well, it's, sometimes it's not and sometimes it is um there are people who are like cynical teachers or like the teacher there are people who are teachers who teach in an iconoclastic way like this is that's nonsense that's nonsense that and that really does help for many people because they feel that is like getting to the bottom of things that's good too and some of those folks are awake and some of those folks aren't it's a, it's different strokes from a but, yeah go ahead <laughs> oh i say but but we are we are I think honesty and being in touch with your truth yeah. is essential in the 21st century. That's the real thing. The onus is on you to be in touch with what you're feeling. And if you feel bullshit's going on, or you feel somebody's being abusive, or you feel uh, this doesn't work for me, then that's what you have to listen to. And that goes along with the whole thing about transmission. I mean, the purpose of transmission is not so you can groove on how great the teacher is. 
The purpose is that you become impregnated in the energy and you bring forth your own sense of grounded transmission. Even prior to meeting a teacher where there's radiance, to whatever degree that you can be in touch with what you're feeling, it's only going to be helpful. And there's ways of being in contact with your own energy that don't need other people. And that's kind of like, is it necessary to have this other thing? Eventually it happens anyway, but it certainly isn't necessary, especially to start. I mean, I, I, I did all kinds of spiritual work for years where I was basically mining, trying to find some oil, you know, get, get to the point where I can actually feel my own radiance, my own, and I, with some result. And it's, it's interesting. I don't know that I would have even been interested in Ken Russell if I hadn't already been doing spiritual work where I had some sense of feeling mm -hmm. so that when I was with him, I can really feel. In other words, you become sensitized to it. And that's the work of anybody if there's work to do before you meet such a one. It's not necessary to meet such a one in the body either. Again, you can. It, it, this is why, because ultimately it's not about them. Ultimately, you could say it's about I'm going to use mythological language. It's about the goddess, really. It's about the energetic pouring that is the center of the universe that you can experience both outside and inside. At first, it's important to feel it inside, but then you will always simply identify as an individual if that's all that you've got. But if you start to feel it coming from outside, that outside should then spread so that it's everywhere. So there's kind of a progression that keeps you from making the means that you're using in any given moment an idol rather than an icon. From my perspective, icon, yes. Idol, no. Idol meaning opaque. This is it. This is the only thing that's going to get it for me. This is the true one. All of that stuff is a stumbling block. Whether it's your technique that you do that gives you kundalini feel, energy, or it's your teacher, or it's, you know, this particular shrine. All of them are useful and beautiful and to be honored. But if you identify it with that, then it stops being a help and it starts being a hindrance. If you're doing it right, it naturally grows beyond the particular forms in which you're doing it. Yes. And, if, and you know, uh, you may end up in an eddy, like, for a while. It's grace when a painful experience is knocking on your door saying, this isn't working. It's like, pay attention to all of the feelings. There's a limit here. It's not, it's not you know, I'm... Because, because that's the beginning of moving out of the eddy into something larger. And you go through an uncomfortable phase of feeling um, you're not here or there yet. But yeah, when it's working, it's always working and ultimately in some sense, because even the eddies are necessary for the time that it's necessary. But they can be very painful when you start to recognize, wow, I'm trapped and I don't know how to get out. Or, wow, my teacher isn't what I thought they were. Mm -hmm. And I'm still getting something from them. What do I do now? You know, and, you know, from my perspective, it's recognizing that your teacher was used by being itself to give you what you've got. And if your teacher isn't being able to recognize that, then they become a limit. And Papaji always recognized that. It was always like, I feel your grace. You'd say, your grace, my grace, grace is grace. If you trust any man, you will always be disappointed. This is the things that, that, that for me, I treasured about the guy. Because he was, he was never really on a throne, and he didn't like that. He was just in a regular seat. But he was always available <laughs> in a human level with warts and all. And you could see him lose his temper. You could see him this way and that way. And then you had to decide, well, is that, he lost his temper. Is that abuse? Should I leave? Should I not? But it was very human. It wasn't like, 
uh, anyway, it's very human. And so that in itself for me brought the whole thing down to earth again. Let's talk a little bit about um, what the individual does, if anything, to facilitate this process. Because very often, it, it, you know, uh, it's it sort of can be overwhelming, can be graceful, can be spontaneous, can be something that seems like it's not under your control at all. But there's also um, a lore of teaching and a life of discipline and practice uh, and the idea that there might be a uh, more optimal mindset or way of approaching this, uh, whether it's in general in life or specifically in sitting down with someone that helps you get into it more effectively, right? Is that, is that the case? Is there an optimal mindset or way of approaching? And if so, what would that be? Or what would some basic things for the individual to do that would help it? assuming they thought it was really happening and had checked with themselves to make sure they were uh, in something that their own authenticity reinforced. But um, what can they do to be responsible, proactive co-participants in the process? And you're speaking specifically of, of transmission and a sense of presence. Yeah. Let's say two people are sitting down and a person wants to be more involved, a greater participant in something that they can sense is available to them with that other person. Oh, with the other person. Yeah. Yeah. Either way, like whether they're thinking of it as a, like some kind of resonance with the other person or they're thinking about it as, you know, the, uh, the ingression of the ultimates into them, just as it is. Yes. Either way. What, what's so yes. well, one thing is attention for their attention. Yeah. One thing is, Okay, so with transmission in general, giving it your attention is is conducive to having it expand and become deeper. In terms of an energetic um, relationship, converse, you know, of course, conversation where you actually ask, is there something more that can happen here in terms of an expansion of feeling if, I mean, if you're speaking in terms of a spiritual teacher, that kind of a thing, or sure, um, yeah. what's the, con cause context sure, is really take that as, as the archetypal example of which yeah. you know, other, other versions would be similar or a little bit different or. Yeah. Well, it depends on you, what you want so much, you know, and, and to be really in all throughout this, to be very much in touch with yourself and what it is that you're feeling as you do whatever you do. Um, to be with somebody and to just um, rest in their presence, to be in their presence, to become, to allow yourself to be receptive in the sense of, um, you, you know, being, so it, in terms of energy, being with somebody's energetic presence and having it become more, to receive it more, again, being in touch with your own energetic presence and noticing the, the places in which you're holding mm -hmm. and opening them up and breathing into them and relaxing. And then also noticing what you feel when you do this. So again, because we spoke earlier about things like abuse and, and hierarchical things, I, I do feel that the metaphor of sexuality is useful. Um, you know, tan tantric is where it's good to, to use that imagery sometimes because in the same way that you don't want to be in a rush. I mean, um, you, you pay attention to what you feel. Does this feel good? Does it feel, does it feel like, so you, you open up, but you pay attention to whether there are any alarm bells or like, I should, uh, it doesn't feel good to open up yet, that kind of thing. So I want to, I would counsel people to not push themselves beyond what feels safe for them and also what feels non exploitative or, you know, like it's got to be consensual and it's got to be just because they're a rock star doesn't mean that they're worthy of your heart. So take your time and open and feel. And it doesn't, 
and and like and like intimate relationships it does any intimate relationship it doesn't necessarily mean when you're afraid that this because they are exploitative but you have to honor where you are so you honor where you are and you be with that don't be overly eager to expand bring yourself to the edge where it starts to become uncomfortable and then pull back into comfort and rest there and then the next time bring yourself to the edge where it feels more comfortable and then when it starts to feel uncomfortable pull back and rest there there's a lot of people who like living on the edge don't live on the edge find the edge and pull back to where you feel safe is that about um doing it or is that about doing it in a healthy secure way because uh it's easy to imagine that maybe even some of the great sages were people who pushed themselves recklessly beyond their limits uh and as a result possibly uh were really good at this skill but also had some trauma or some weirdness around it down the line because they didn't do it in a in an organic assimilative fashion right very good that's ver- that's a huge subject i would go with it's skill the skillful way to go but that didn't but there you know i would also say that we know about the great ones who did that and were great if you i mean uh, you know if you go to india you can find a lot of people who did that and are not able to take care of themselves um and you know in other words or a lot of places i mean we know about um kundalini casualties the world uh, you know uh, world history is, is is littered with people who <laughs> did the other and um so it yeah there are heroic people people who are usually the lineage founders you know like you can read the about the mahasiddhas um but a lot of the mahasiddhas if you're okay with being homeless then go for it or if you're okay with somebody thinking you need to be institutionalized go for it it doesn't mean that that's i mean i don't really and i mean that quite sincerely i have no judgment of that i mean you can find people who are like nityananda swami nityananda a perfect case of somebody who's who's you know uh what they call a gori or there's different names in different traditions must um divine madness like just blown out but there's also the thing about uh, exploitation we're talking 21st century spirituality and being practical there are you know there are people who you know in intimate relationships who throw caution to the wind and they have it's a great experience for them they just throw all caution to the wind i know he was supposed to be horrible for me and it worked out really great and yeah i visit him in prison every year it's okay it doesn't matter i still love him so it's all right i'm kidding but okay that's a bad joke let's see the point is is that you can be with people you can be with teachers who are totally safe and you are taking your time with them to make sure because in the end you're going to have to be the one that's comfortable with this whole situation is it can you just like shatter it happens it's it's sort of like th- somebody who throws all caution to the wind in in a relationship even though their friends tell them not to that's going to happen so he, i'm telling people what it's probably best not to do that but there's going to be people for whom you know any any advice at all is not going to be heeded in the face of of what seems to be you know the perfect thing i'm going to do it there's a lot of there's a lot of people for whom backlash i, I you know i've had i've had experience with teachers prior to kenda who i feel were exploitative and um and you know so i'm i'm just not including them in my resume at this point and um you have to pick up the pieces afterwards and it hurts uh and so i i think if you if i had listened to some of the alarm bells earlier i would have saved myself time and 
also um, energy and and lack of less trauma. So, that's a long way of long way of agreeing with you, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm thinking that you strike me as a guy who has a pretty strong and maybe has always had a pretty strong somatic awareness, a sense of, you know, what's going on inside my body and what do these vibrations feel like? And that there's a, there is an inside of me that I can check to see how these things feel. And, you know, uh, maybe I, I have some kind of resonating interior and I wonder how much that particular skill set, which differs from person to person, is useful in this practice? Is it, is it just a way that some people go about doing it with this extra set of information they have by being able to feel inside themselves pretty well? Or is it so useful that we would say to a person that isn't very good at it, that maybe you should practice gaining that particular skill set to help you in spirituality and satsang and transmission? I feel it is so useful that I would always recommend that people yeah, I remember. Um, I, I I don't know that I always had it either, by the way. Um, but I certainly had it just before meeting Ken Russell, and with Ken Russell, it was very developed. I mean, that's really what you know, he, his thing was not about awakening, but about working on just that. So that became established for me early on, and it's really really important. I remember once being with Papaji, and there was a man there who asked him. Who said to him, I know you have these relationships with Krishna and Jesus, you know, even though you're like an enlightened and advaitin area of relation. What about Durga? So this is Durga is like the primary goddess in Hinduism or the most popular goddess, who's sort of like the goddess of goddesses. Or one version of the goddess of goddesses. And he said, every master has a relationship with Durga. If you don't know how to feed your own energy, how will you know where to go? That's how important somatic feeling is. It's like where you're pulled, where you're attracted, if somebody's there and you feel good, or if there's a technique you do or a practice you do and, it, and, you, and you are in touch with what you're feeling, it's so important. Uh, it's a way for you to know where to go. It's, you, you could say it's a way for you to not simply use your head to take the next step. Um, I mean, if you're a spiritual practitioner and you are doing things without that, why would you deprive yourself of, of being able to see? I mean, you, you can live a life without it, but if, if it is as easy as a little bit development and you can see, um, then certainly you can nego navigate so much better. So, yeah. From your point of view, what's a good strategy for how people deal with particular content that arises in, in satsang? They have visions or they have particular experiences or particular downloads of information or uh, specific shifts in their sense of identity or something like that. Because one way is to think well, this is being brought up for a reason. I should investigate this. I should work with this. Another way is to say, oh, well, no, those are just side effects you should release and just dismiss them as they come up. Uh, how do you handle that? Well, it, it really depends on what your what you're there for and what you're interested in exploring. So, you know, in the tapestry of being orientation that, um, that, that I've discovered or that I, they've laid out, I acknowledge that depending on the school, the answer is different. And, and, and it's not, and, and that says that you see, okay, this is, let's go a little bit, meta on this it's helpful for folks i think it's important for people to uh, to understand that um it's not just out there and you've got to find it it's not like there's a truth that you have to find a truth that you have to find if you are um 
interested in discovering, knowing, uh, awakening to consciousness itself, because you've heard about it, or you've met someone who seemed to be at peace and or happy or released in some way that you recognize as something that you'd like. And they said, yes, I'm resting as consciousness itself. And, um, you know, I just simply watch whatever thoughts arise and whatever feelings come up. I just, just see them uh, as the activity of mind and then they release. Then you're, uh, you're attracted to consciousness itself teachings. And then if you go to be with people who teach some spiritual form, pay attention. You're going to have your radar open like, oh, he's not teaching that. He's teaching about kundalini and, and, and expanding energy and, and all those feelings and stuff. And, uh, and this one's talking about devotion to, you know, Rama. And I'm not interested in, but this one is just talking about consciousness itself. And this is the person that I want to be with right now because I want to learn this. And so then, yeah, ignore all of those experiences. Because if you're there to clarify for yourself the nature of consciousness itself, what is aware of expanded feelings? What is aware of devotional feelings? What is aware of the energy that's moving in your spine? What is aware of um, your thoughts? That's what's important. What is, the, what is awareness itself? And that then is the stance of those schools as well, you know, whether it's you know, um, Zen or Advaita Vedanta or even Theravadan schools, which are... Um, like, don't pay attention to whatever phenomena is happening. In the case of Theravadan schools, they're more about doing this practice, right? Like with Vipassana or Samatha meditation, it's just doing this practice. So you ignore everything because, and maybe you were drawn because you wanted to do that practice because you saw the results in other people or you read about them or you feel like it would be helpful for you. So then you're focused doing that. So all of them are legitimate, Right. Then you go to you. You say, "Well, I've met somebody, and I, they have this incredible presence. And when I'm with them, I can feel this love and this presence of love. And those teachings are about expanding um, the somatic sense of feeling in all directions. So, in that case, if you're sitting and you're in the transmission, and they will expand, then you absolutely pay attention to that because that's what you're there for." Does that make sense? Yeah. There's a lot of um, a lot of your remarks focus on the ability of, let's say, students or participants to be more authentic and more responsible in what they're trying to do, what they're looking for, how they can handle it in a way that doesn't overload them, things like that. Uh, I'm curious what your thoughts are on the the reciprocal responsibility of teacher transmitters. Right. The, the ethics of that is, is a contested topic. Uh, obviously, we're, you know, very often we're dealing with strange, risky, iconoclastic characters, or they wouldn't be in that position to begin with. Yes. And there's certainly no, uh, you know, bureaucratic ethics committee that could actually enforce <laughs> rules in most sense. And certainly not historically, that wasn't the case. That wasn't so, the case. Yeah. You know, what are some good general principles for transmitters going forward? <laughs> right. Well, I could say that, you know, like I'm a part of the waking, uh, the, the Trillium Awakening Teachers, Teachers Association. And so that's an organization where we are held to account for. Uh, you know, sexual ethics and certain power ethics and things like that. Um, so there are groups that you can, you know, there are guilds you can join as a teacher if, you know, you want the students involved to know that you're all held to account. I mean, you know, what to, what to say about this? There's, there's, I'll, okay, I'll say this. There's, I, I'm not sure. I want to make sure that I'm answering your question because I'm, I'm, um, I can go off 
on tangents, as you can see. Um, and I, so if, if I'm not, please steer me back and keep me on there. Sure. The thing about, the thing about the nature of, of spirit, spiritual life, as soon as you enter into the realm of spiritual life, whether as a student or a teacher, you're an, if, if, you, if there's any sincerity at all, you will find yourself in a situation in which it is apparent that things that are very uncomfortable, things that can be out and out harmful, are at times the best thing that could have happened. It starts to become apparent that you don't really ultimately know whether something is good or bad. If you wait, you see the results of something led to other things that produced, can produce resilience, can produce awakenings, all kinds of things can come out of it. Often, <clears throat> a student will be um, <clears throat> hiding from their own motives, hiding from their own, not seeing their own ego, not seeing their own, um, the ways in which they're tangled. And even a, 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 a harsh or any kind of reaction from the teacher could bring forward that, make it clear to the person in a way that wasn't clear before. It can even be violent, right? So that is reality. That is the way it is at the spiritual level. I mean, that is a fact that can't be denied. And it's an entirely different issue than the way that teachers should comport themselves from my perspective. A teacher should act responsibly and should be sensitive to the experience of their students, should not take advantage of any students, power-wise, sexual-wise, financially, any of those. They should be in integrity. It's so easy to say, everybody knows it. Um, the thing is, is that often both students and teachers will say, well, something wonderful happened out of this. And I'm not denying that that doesn't happen. But it should be, if the teacher screws up, the teacher screwed up. And <clears throat> that should be taken into account. So um, I don't know. Is that helpful? <laughs> to yeah, have both of those out there? Um, this, that balance of of integrity and owning up to things while also still providing a context in which people could be deeply upset by what's happening, <laughs> that those <That's> are compatible. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you could say a good teacher is tapping into what you could, we can just say called the guru principle. And the guru principle is something that is using the teacher. If the teacher is, is there, the guru principle is totally outside the bounds of right and wrong, good and bad from, from a human perspective. The teacher isn't from my perspective at all. They have, they, they're just like anybody else. They are existentially equal to you. You are existentially equal to them. Um, functionally, um, there is a hierarchy. I mean, <laughs> Nowadays, it's like oh, hierarchy, the evil, don't talk in terms of, well, you know, um, if you don't think there's any hierarchies, then you shouldn't be going to any teachers at all, period. But if you acknowledge that there's some hierarchy functionally, you're coming there and you're going to see them and you're sitting with them, then you should know that that functional hierarchy, whether it's elaborate or simple, you know, 
just the fact that you go and they're sitting on a chair and you're sitting in the audience. There's some hierarchy there, but it might be not, nothing else. Or it can be really elaborate, like I said, with thrones and this is Lama so-and-so and they're up there and everybody rises from when they do that and there's people bowing and all of that. None of the functional hierarchy cancels out the existential equality. And when it seems to do that, get out of there as quick as you can. There are uh, certain forms that seem like they lend themselves to the conflation of political status differential uh, versus the functional hierarchy. I'm, I'm thinking of languaging around uh, surrender and submission. And these are great classical terms that they're very evocative. They describe a kind of gestural mode and a devotional frequency that can be very uh, useful in these contexts, but they also very easily lend themselves to some kind of interpersonal status situation. And I'm wondering yes. whether you think that in the future we will develop better phraseology that's free of some of those problematic elements to it. Or will there always be something uniquely useful about those classic heuristic phrases? I guess we'll see. It's a good point. It's a good question. There may be phrases that can continue. Well, you know, it's it's strange. It's like the word surrender. Let's say it's a, it's also it's a, like a war metaphor. You know. But the way in which you've, you're letting go into the grace of the other, that has to be, you know, maintained or, or you lose that, that capacity or, or that way of doing spirituality. Again, uh, it's interesting because, you know, sex is exploited, exploited a lot in the, the Hindu um, People who come to America, and I'm, I'm a guru, Hindu, Buddhist, all of them. Uh, that's been one of the big scandals that have been, you know. So boundaries there are really important, and pe and and people um, not making light of this is important. Um, and uh, surrender to a teacher in some cases uh, or in many cases, let's say, put it that way, is is the way for people. Is, is actually, the, not because it's been dictated to them. I guess that's one of the points I would make to differentiate. For me, a, a big deal is if somebody is trying to tell you that you need to surrender to them, or if they have a structure of teaching that says you need to do this, it's inherently problematic. Inherently. I... I I remember I wanted to see a particular teacher who had a very, 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 very strong transmission, very controversial guy. Um, he's no longer with us, um, but had a reputation for incredible transmission, really good books. You could even read the books and you'd feel the transmission. And it's like, wow, this guy's interesting anyway. A little strange, but interesting. Um, dresses up in funny costumes sometimes. Um, I don't know. Mm -hmm. People are a little bit too devoted to him. I don't know. But I had a friend, really good friend, who said, I can arrange for you to see this guy. I was like, oh, not everybody gets to see him. Okay. And the folks called me <clears throat> to make sure that I was okay. And they kept saying to me, if you feel something, will you surrender to him? You know, I went, well, I'm going to go, but this is, I want to see this guy. It turned out that he canceled the trip, so I never got to see him anyway, and then he passed on. But the thing is, is that if somebody is like trying to sell you that you have to surrender to somebody if you feel something, something is off. There's something inherently exploitative about it. Even if the guy does have great transmission and he's a spiritual genius, still, there's a, an exploitive edge there when you're, or, and maybe that's not true, maybe there isn't, but for me, 
I won't go there. You know, I won't, I won't, I'm not interested in, put it this way. It made it harder for me. I can't imagine that I was going to surrender to him. I just, now it was like, I want to see him because I want to experience this transmission, but I'm not having anything to do with the guy because look at this sub this structure that he has around him to, to make sure that everybody's a yes man before they even get there. It's like, that is not um, natural. On the other hand, if you see a teacher and you feel their transmission and you yourself find yourself falling in love, it's like any falling in love relationship from my perspective. You, I mean, it's a, you know, it's a spiritual relationship. You're not physically going to consummate it. That's important. <laughs> but the thing is, is that opening up your heart and surrendering is something that you do with your beloved you know and and you know of course it's metaphoric again you're not having sex with them but you it's good to surrender during sex it's just it's good it means that you trust the other person and then something happens beyond both you and the other person through that consummation same thing with spiritual relationships certain spiritual relationships many spiritual relationships to surrender to your master it can be a beautiful experience my own experience with papaji was like this um, it, it, they, you know, um, there were times when I didn't surrender and he would say, oh, hmm, okay, all right. You know, I remember I kept coming, I said, I give you my mind. And I, second, third time I came back and said, I give you my mind. He said, you gave me your mind last time. This is not real giving. And I went, oh, <laughs> yeah, it's true. And I picked it up again. Um, but, you know, there is a, there is a, a, a place for devotional relationships. They make us uncomfortable, and they should. But that doesn't mean they're not real. You know, public displays of affection make people uncomfortable too, but it doesn't mean the people aren't in love. Um, you know, or that the, it doesn't mean there's a necessarily exploitation going on. Um, so there's, there's something, there's some, there can be something positive there. I, I, I want to say that the, the guru-disciple relationship is going to continue to be something, I think. Um, because I think it's a natural relationship. Um, all the stuff around it can go through tremendous transformations. It could get st stripped down to nothing also. Um, but existential equality is always the case, no matter what. Um, and that's something to look for. And it's easy for things to get conflated. So, yeah. In terms of the teachers... They have big responsibility. They have all the responsibility, really, to um, hold their human needs, be honest about their human needs, to take care of their human needs in a dignified and human way. Thinking about ecology now, because, I mean, so much of this is, a, is human to human and cosmic. And then there's a the question of like, what was it like for our prehistoric ancestors, for the you know the shamanic origins of these lineages, where a lot of the time it seems like natural contexts or non-human uh, intelligences of various kinds in the ecosystem were uh, performing, you know, the guru function for human beings. And at the same time, on the other side, is there a utility to the living system of uh, satsang transmissions and contagions and that sort of thing is there the potential that it plays a role in the energetic ecosystem that is essential to the maintenance uh, of the natural world you know it, when somebody asked me what's the use of satsang i should have called you in to come in because <laughs> that's that's very well said um it, it, it you know again the teaching it depends on the teaching um but but just generally like, you know, like I said, you know, if you're going to a teacher for just consciousness itself, it's less likely that the transmission that you experience there is going to be used in such a way that you're connecting to fairies and, you know, devas and bikinis and all of that. But it's possible because that grace is there. It's just not necessarily utilized that way. But um, certainly especially in tantric lineages, you know, um, uh, Kashmir Shaivism, things like this, where there's a 
real emphasis on the transmission, the somatic feeling sense and expansion, as well as the container or the, the space in which everything is arising. That um, emphasis on the energy itself can sensitize you so that you are now in the uh, energetic presence relationships with all kinds of other other dimensions and beings and nature and everything like this and 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 ultimately from my perspective that's the ultimate import anyway whether it's an advaita satsang or 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 another satsang is you are to be on your own eventually and to be on your own is to be taught by the universe if there's any more teaching to do so I know in, in Advaita, they go, well, there's no more teaching because I'm just being and everything is just happening by itself. And yet, there is even in those traditions, stories of synchronicities that drew Papaji to see Ramana Maharshi, drew Ramana Maharshi to live in Arunachala. Things happen and they're drawn and they listen and they pay attention. And there was no physical guru telling them to do these things. They were in touch with the larger field, and that larger field was directing them and guiding them. And so Ramana's uncle, I think, mentions Arunachala. So what is that? That's God speaking to Ramana through uh, his uncle to go to Arunachala. And you know, all of these, there's there's a way in which you're open to divine guidance. And divine guidance will use any form that's available to speak to you. And that, that sensibility is open through the sensitivity to your energetic presence identity, um, which gets enlivened through satsang. So absolutely, um, you're not always going to have, everybody dies, uh, everything changes, communities fall apart. So what is it that you get from being in a satsang? Um, you might have nice, long human relationships or a relationship with your teacher, but that might not be very long. You don't know. But what you do have is that opening to the divine teacher, to the master of masters, who is the intelligence that is on the other side of what you experience. And to be in relationship to that one which is, you know, ultimately you could say your higher self or, you know, um, uh, yeah, or your divine twin, as, as the Gnostics like to say, um, a, a co-joined twin who you're inseparable from, who you, you are one with, but is able to be in con con um, contact with you and lead you. Um, I think what some Sufis call it Holy Spirit Angel, um, the guide, to be in touch with that, and also to be in communion with the, the earth and to, be, to, to feel the presence of the trees and to feel the presence of, 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 of the universe um, as individual beings, and to be sensitive to the energies of your friends and loved ones and family and all of that is all part of that. So yeah, ec ecology most definitely um, in every sense, um, interconnectedness. That's a very uh, beautiful sentiment with which to bring this toward the end. But I thought I would check in to see if there's anything else uh, exciting on this topic. You know, is it is there outstanding things you like to ponder on it that I haven't asked you about or any other thing that you would, you know, surface around the topics of transmission and satsang? No, that's, that, that, nothing's coming. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been, um, very lovely, very cogent. I appreciate your integrity and your flexibility. And the, there's a real, uh, real humanity, I think, to the way you approach these topics. Uh, thank you very much, Krishna. Thank you so much, Lehman. It's really great to talk with you. And uh, I look forward to seeing you again.